To earn more, the miners needed to haul bigger loads, so they were looking for something stronger than rope. Which is why alternatives like metal chains came about. Trouble is, compared to rope, metal chain has a nasty way of breaking. So now I want to test a 10 millimeter metal chain, the same diameter as the rope we snapped. I'm gonna film it with a slow motion camera while using water from a friendly fire crew to gradually increase the weight in a skip. Are you ready for some film? Yeah, yeah carry on. on. And the load's now starting to go up. So we've got to 800. Remember, the same size rope broke at just 640 kilos, not even two thirds of a tonne. Just about to hit 1.7 tonnes. So now we're hanging a large car from it. The chain is rated at two and a half tonnes, but we've already hit over three and a half tonnes and it's still holding. Now we're running out of water. We've probably got about a minute supply. What you're okay. telling me is our chain right, is too strong. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> oh, there you go. Or maybe not. <laughs> 3,790. Just like in the mines, the chain takes a much greater load than rope, but it breaks catastrophically and without any warning. Oh, oh that's go. perfect. So that's exactly, it's where the two links cross over, and that's it's that right, yes. shearing, it's where it's bending it round. So how quickly were you recording this? We were recording at 2,000 frames per second. So that broke in less than five milliseconds? Yes. So you'd have Mystery no warning at all? Instant. Ah, you have the culprit. We found the link here in the water, and so you can see here where it's failed. So the significance of this is where it's gone is a weak point inherent to the chain. It's, it's where exactly. It's, it's inherent to the, to the design of the chain that the material here is going to see a shear stress that's going to cause it to fail. And this shear strain, this is this bending, that's, every chain has that weak. Every chain is going to have that weakness at that point. And that's what cost lives down the mines. Exactly, yes. A failure that catastrophic yes. and that quick. What can you do? What can you do? And that's where a great invention for a German silver mine comes in. In 1829, Herr Wilhelm Albert, director of a Klausthal silver mine, having witnessed chain links snap without warning, was inspired to reconsider the merits of rope. So what was needed to haul huge loads of silver from deep in the mine was something that combined the structure of rope with the strength of metal. Herr Wilhelm Albert discovered just that. He twisted metal strands together to form a metal rope, the world's first cable. To prove Wilhelm Albert was onto something, we tested cable. No surprise, we quickly got the skip to overflowing. The cable, although the same diameter as the chain, is easily carrying over 800 kilos more, and well over 4,000 kilos more than the rope. It's the best of both worlds. Twisting metal strands together like rope means cable is exceptionally strong. And when it fails, it should give ample warning, just like rope. And back at Milau, the engineers were utterly confident in the strength of their metal ropes. At one point during construction, almost 170 metres of deck hung over the valley from just six cables. The completed bridge is designed to carry 35,000 tonnes. That's the equivalent of pickup trucks crammed nose to tail in all lanes, piled ten high. To prove the cable's strength, engineers organized a showy demonstration. 28 trucks with a combined weight of over 900 tons drove to the midpoint. The cables barely gave. The span bent a mere 26 centimeters. A triumph then for Wilhelm Albert's metal rope idea. But there's a neat twist here at Milan. This bridge is designed to last 120 years, but inevitably, a century-old cable isn't as strong as a new one. But if the bridge is held up by cables, how do you take them down to replace them without the bridge falling down? Well, 
the answer to that lies in the construction of the cables themselves. Because from above, they look like a single solid piece. But in fact, each one is made up of a bundle of as many as 91 smaller cables. Here they are. Those smaller cables, in fact, are then each made up of seven individual strands. And their job is crucial, those middle-sized cables, because each of those can be taken down and replaced if they corrode without having to take down the entire bundle. Prompted by accidents in German silver mines over 180 years ago, the inspired idea to make rope from metal strands has made the magnificent Milau Bridge possible. But the bridge would still collapse in the scorching summer heat without an engineering solution borrowed from the ancient Celtic boat builders. Building with metal comes with one massive drawback. The hotter it gets, the more it expands. Let me show you a little example of metal expansion. This is a heavy-duty jar, pretty tough to break. This is a metal core. Putting the jar around the core, I shall now apply heat. And, well, you probably guess what's going to happen if I heat up the metal core and expand the metal. Add heat to metal and it expands. This becomes a problem, though, when the metal is up against a material that's much less flexible, in this case, glass. And while we're waiting for something to happen, it's worth thinking, where else might we find large amounts of metal interacting with a material that doesn't like to bend? The tiny expansion in this demonstration scales up the more metal involved. Rail track can dramatically expand in extreme heat, and with nowhere to go, it inconveniently buckles. If this were to happen on a bridge, it could be a disaster. On your average bridge, you leave gaps, expansion joints, to take up movement of the deck with changes in temperature. But this is not your average bridge. The Milau Bridge has been welded into one continuous piece of steel from end to end. The only place for expansion gaps is where the road meets the valley at either side. In the heat of summer, these expansion joints have a critical job to do. Every summer, the bridge is heated up and it expands. The engineers predict that at 40 degrees, it grows by about 1.2 meters. And that's what this section is for, to allow it to do that. The expansion joints above my head, that you can hear the traffic thundering over, allow the road to remain a continuous surface as the bridge moves backwards and forwards on these mounting points. Even the cables taking power to it are designed to be flexible with that movement. And that's all well and good here, where the bridge meets the land. But it does it doesn't expand just at its ends. It expands all along its length. So what do you do at the points where it's fixed to those concrete piers? Obviously, the deck has to be fixed to the piers for stability. But in summer heat, the two and a half kilometers of horizontal deck expand. It's the growth along its length that's the real problem because it exerts a massive, unstoppable force on the vertical concrete piers. And concrete is notoriously unbendy. So the engineers came up with a very clever solution. The base of each pier is solid. But the top 90 meters is split into two thin arms. How does this weird design overcome a potentially fatal threat? That brings us to our final connection, prehistoric Celtic boats. For centuries, the ancient Celtic peoples of Ireland and Wales used ingenious boats called currachs. They were made of a bent wood frame and covered with hide, or sometimes canvas. The key to making concrete flexible enough to withstand summer heat lies in the wooden skeleton of some of these boats. In some currucks, pieces of wood, including a keel stringer, would run under the boat from stem to stern. They had to be strong, but also had to curve. Even flexible timber can only bend so far, but some early woodworkers found a way around this. To find out how, 
I'm visiting the carpentry shop of Peter Faulkner, whose passion is building these craft. Peter. Richard, hello. hello. So, you run a workshop here building traditional boats using ancient skills, but there is a link to do with the way the pillars of our bridge are built. It is to do with that split in them, and I think before we can really understand it a bit more, we need to split some wood. How do you do it? To cleave it, yes? Yes, yep. cleave, that's the word. You, you want to cleave some now? Yes, I'd like to cleave some wood. Right, right. A couple of pieces here. That's a piece of wood. That's a piece of ash? Yes. So, we just make a... I'm going to put in a wedge. Cleave away. Right. So, do you want to have a tap? I'd love a tap, yes. You, you, you'll, soon, you'll soon work out. Right. These are not modern tools, are they? No. But then I guess this tells us that actually people have known about cleaving wood for a long time. This isn't new technology, is it? No, no, no. Prehistoric. I mean, we, we don't know. 10, 20,000 years. Cleaving the wood like this means it splits along its natural grain and keeps its strength. But it also changes the flexibility of the wood dramatically. Let's imagine this now was one of the pillars supporting our bridge. The problem here, remember, is flexibility because the road deck is so long when it gets hot it expands and it moves out this way or it shrinks back this way when it gets cold and that needs flexibility. It'll just snap the pillar. With these splits in it, I mean, this is, this will bend as much as you like, but because we've left the same amount of wood in it, the same amount of stuff, it's still just as strong at holding things up. There's as much to work under compression. I feel a test coming on, with two pieces of timber exactly the same size. Right, what I have here is my unique and custom-built flex test rig. This is one of the pillars, OK, represented by this big chunk of wood. And actually, proportionally, it's almost the same as the pillars, width to height. I'm going to test an uncleaved post first. I've added these straws to measure how far it will bend before it snaps. What happens to this? If it flexes, it'll start to knock these little straws out. So, using this winch, I will pull on that wire to apply the same force as if the road deck were expanding out this way on top of my giant pillar. Wish me luck. Now we're making our way towards the first of my little pegs. How far will it bend? Oh, we got one. The tension grows as the deck expands. Oh, no, it's all gone wrong. Well, we've hit three of the little straws, but, oh, yeah, that's not good at all, is it? Now, with a new post, Peter uses wedges to drive a split in it. Will this cleaved timber really bend further than the last post? Right, now, to simulate another hot day at our bridge. The sun comes up and warms two kilometres of steel road deck. It expands and pushes our column. That split in the wood is allowing it to flex. It can still support the same weight from above, but it's coping. Right, that's four. I'm going to see if I can get it back. So this split timber has gone twice as far without breaking as the first unsplit one. But will it return to its original state? As I release the tension, the wooden test pair shows it handles the stress without any permanent damage. All of that flexibility given to it just by this split in it down to there at the top lets it bend. It can still support, but now it can bend. Modern woodworkers believe Celtic boat builders use this same principle for their currents. The wooden keel stringer could be split to allow it to bend whilst keeping it strong and sturdy. On the Milau Bridge, concrete, which is usually more like brittle glass, can become more flexible with a split in the right place. I decided to go to the top of one of the concrete piers to find out just how they cope with the deck movement in summer. I wish to have it. The ladder is strong. Four. Climbing the ladder down onto the tiny inspection platform precariously positioned on the tallest bridge pier on Earth was more than scary. 